Hey everybody, how you guys doing? I'm Eric Erlock, and this is another talk on Greek philosophy, specifically Plato's Meno. In a series of talks on Plato's dialogue and Greek philosophy I'm doing for Berkeley City College. So, Plato wrote the Apology and the Crito very early, it seems, to many. Many scholars order Plato's dialogues depending on how Plato talks, which is a complicated thing, and how Plato treats Socrates, and people have their theories, but many people follow the idea that there's earlier and later dialogues of Plato, and earlier and later Socrates and Plato, and I'm going to follow that scheme decently. So it is thought by many scholars that Plato wrote about a guy named Socrates who was killed, whether or not Plato or his relatives knew Socrates, it's possible Plato's uncle knew Socrates, Plato himself may never have known Socrates, possibly, depending on how, how you think he talks about him, uh, whether as if he knows him or not, as we'll talk about. But that you have early Socrates who goes around questioning people and acts like nobody knows anything, and then Plato evolves Socrates and his plays, it seems, in which Socrates increasingly goes from dialoguing with people and showing nobody knows what they know, which is dramatically and beautifully portrayed in the Symposium, which we will get to. But here with the Mino, you have another early dialogue in which Socrates is going back and forth with different people, showing that people know but don't know, and really don't know things that they think they know. So they either don't know or they know and don't know what they know. But then it moves in through the Republic. Pretty much it is book two of the Republic where Socrates somewhat takes over as a lecturer and then Timaeus and others take over as lecturers in the laws and other things in which they go on and on and on and tell you uh, Socrates and other figures and they lecture what the truth very much is rather than have dialogues back and forth which are more entertaining as plays, honestly, I imagine. I haven't watched many people put on any of this. But dialogues in which you go back and forth, the Symposium is really one of the best of the early and somewhat early middle of Plato. And then Plato around Republic decides he wants to be a bit more Pythagorean and a bit more Parmenidean and lecture people a bit more via Socrates and other mouthpieces about what is. So Plato's Mino is still early Plato and Socrates, and the Apology and the Crito, as best as it seems, we have the Apology and the Crito. I found out accidentally, it seems as if by ordering the dialogues as best I can thematically and then also chronologically, as best as I understand others' orders, and they came up with it long before I believe I've been alive, in generations of scholarship. It seems like actually in English, oddly enough, these are alphabetized. I only noticed it's like Apology, Crito, Mino, and then it goes down the, to the Theotetus after Republic, and it's like, are these oddly alphabetized for any reason? I don't think so. But, and they wouldn't be in Greek. I mean, the letters are all different, of course, and out of order, plenty. So that's not going not out of the same order. Is there order? That, yeah, that's not going to work. But oddly enough, they seem, if you look on my website down here, it looks like they're oddly alphabetized in English, but they're actually chronological, I have to say, if that seems it. I didn't order them alphabetically in English. I ordered them, or the Romance languages, uh, post-Roman script. Is that, yeah, the Romantic Romans. But yes, they happen to be uh, oddly alphabetical, and so we have here that Plato's early Socrates is still early working his way back and forth with folks like Mino, and arguing and showing them they know and don't know. And the Mino is a particularly interesting thing for knowing that we don't know. Unknown knowns and Donald Rumsfeld. Anachronistically, speaking of which, it means that the rest of Plato's dialogues that we're going to study are supposed to have happened in very much after. You have early Socrates, oddly here, who dies being very early Socrates, and then Socrates has to go, sort of go back in time with later Plato because he's dead. So if he's going to talk to anybody, it has to be earlier flashbacks, effectively, for an audience who have already seen him die. It's like a Quentin Tarantino movie. It's all out of, you know, it's all over the place. Is that you have Socrates flashing around having these earlier, sometimes as a boy, sometimes as a later uh, mature, uh, powerful thinker. He's going around talking to all these people and having earlier style and then later more luxury style encounters. 
I mentioned with uh, Chinese and Indian thought, you will have great thinkers like Jesus and Socrates go around having dialogues with specific thinkers and figures, which is not only recording the history and where they've been, who they've talked to, but also laying out the philosophy, which is history and real and fleshed life, in which they are dialoguing with this or that position. So... Basically, we're going to flash back to the future here, and we're going to go back in time to Socrates uh, ticking everybody off uh, before they decide to kill him for it, and his uh, after his trial, in which he decides to tell people who say, "Yeah, he's pretty guilty. Yeah, you should give me free meals for life because I'm guilty." Death, <laughs> you know, death and taxes. So, yeah. We're going to watch Socrates now question people in the rest of Plato and sort of tick everyone off continuously. In fact, then we're going to work our way alphabetically, oddly, all the way the, to the Theatetus, where Socrates, after sitting down uncomfortably with, as we unpleasantly have to talk about, somewhat oiled up boys, which he finds beautiful, he then decides, and by the way, I'm off to some kind of trial, don't worry, we'll pick this up next week. And of course, ta-da... Is it hot in here? You know, thank you. You've been a great audience, you know? And then, yeah, it's a routine. Again, it's more stand-up routines from the comedian here. It's like, I'm just going to, you know, I have to go see a man about the form of a horse. So Socrates, as shown in the Apology and the Crito, is concerned with the good. I just had a student showing me about diatim and the good a bit more so. It was awesome. And that, yes, we pursue the good, what we love, and yes, that you can see that Diatima teaches Socrates things about love and that you should, and then Socrates very much imitates the women in his life and says, well, Diatima and Aspasia taught me that you should uh, seek out what you love and the good, which is kind of vague because it's higher than any particular thing. People can say it's monotheistic-y a bit. And that he is saying beyond the many, there is some kind of oneness and goodness and happiness and that we should seek that out. And that is even above the mortal life and sphere. We already just had the credo. He's like, well, I got to give up my life. I don't know. So it's even the good and the happiness is above the life and the mortal sphere, which many uh, materialist kind of uh, minded folk would say, well, I don't know how much happiness is beyond the mortal sphere. And uh, for Socrates or the Epicureans to whom death is nothing. And Socrates seems to say as much. Although then he talks about ticking off Homer and Hesiod on the Elysian fields. And I hope for their sake right now, he isn't there with them. So, you know, whatever your concerns with the afterlife are. So Socrates is pursuing the good, also called virtue or arite in the Greek. Aridi, you know, is, uh, yes, aridi is uh, our pronunciations today. Mino, a rich student of the sophist Gorgias, uh, Georgias. Georgia, you know, the devil went down to Gorgias, is visiting Athens, Georgia, and argues with Socrates about the nature of goodness, claiming to know a great deal about the subject because he's paid for it. Of course, Socrates, true to form, so shows me know that he is quite unclear on the subject namely himself and knowing thyself, the subject and the subjective. Mino begins by asking Socrates if virtue can be taught. Socrates replies that they should clarify what they mean by virtue. And this is always a good philosophical conversation, you know what I mean? It's like, well, this is cool. What do you mean by cool, man? You know, are you cool, man? And Mino says that his teacher, Gorgias, has argued that virtue is different for different people. For adult men, virtue is staying alive. Ha, ha, ha. Such that one can laugh and have the last. While helping friends and harming enemies. Harming enemies. Again, it's great. There's a couple of people here, here and in the Republic, um, who are like, well, goodness is harming enemies. It's like, that is a little bit more polytheistic compared to monotheistic, oddly. You would more so have monotheistic folks being like, no, there will be peace to all. Because you have more larger empire-building cultures. And then you have smaller, more polytheistic cultures like the Greeks, which is much more Conan the Barbarian to hear the lamentations of their women. Our governator out here from California formerly said, you know, not as governator anyway. But yeah, it's like to hear, to take the pain of the other tribe. If you have tribes of human beings who are warring with other tribes perpetually, like the many gods of a many warring family of more more animistic, polytheistic times, then you would hope death to your enemies, hurrah, you know, like the Vikings. But if you're more empire building like Buddhists and Christians and Muslims, you'd be like, there will be peace, whether or not there will be how many pieces of bread for whom and how much peace, you know, following the peace land and bread, you know. But yeah, I mean, there's all of that. And then there's wrestling and ha ha ha. Yes. Staying alive with Gorgias. 
who hopefully is still with us. So for adult men, again, virtue is specifically helping friends and harming enemies. Uh, for Plato's Republic, this position is again taken up by Thrasymachus. For women, children, and slaves, it is virtuous to be obedient. Well, that's good. Men are men, and then everybody else is again. Are where? Yes. Where the men are, uh, where the women are strong, the men are good looking, and the children are above average. You know, next to Lake Wobegon. So Socrates disagrees, and he argues that virtue must be one and the same for all, regardless of age, gender, or position. Which is not Socrates necessarily being a gender-bending, you know, feminist of ancient Athens, even though he is following women into his thinking, which again, many a man, of, I guess, online would find suspicious. But he is certainly, he is not necessarily saying, let's uproot Athens, you know what I mean, and be all progressive. But he certainly does say, interestingly enough, that he thinks that the slave and the master should have the same form of good, which, of course, early Socrates will leave the good thus quite formless. He's not going to tell us much about, we just sort of vaguely strive for it as human beings. And then it's about book two of the Republic, where Plato seems to give up on this, and her uh, Socrates being all too Heraclitean, and like, well, it's just kind of flowing with the conversation of the gods and the people and stuff. And he's like, now nah, let's get a little bit more uh, Pythagorean, and let's have a little bit more ratios of rational triangles and fiery types of uh, proportionate to water and stuff, such that we can have a nice balanced uh, mathematical cosmos. Earlier, it's a bit more Heraclitean with Socrates. He shows that he can surf out these fools, and yet he does not know what the form of the good is ever, and he just stings people, which is in the Mino here, him stinging people and being the stingray, uh, that he has stunned himself because he stings himself. Let's not overthink it. Four, so you basically have men have to be rational, everybody else serve them. That's very much Aristotle. As mentioned to students, it's I come from Berkeley uh, and am here right now, actually, come to think it. And it's great. It's like Aristotle thinks, well, men have been in power and they've subjugated women and children and all that's the core of civilization. And it's like, and right where the feminist, you know, would be like, no, you know, and yes, you're right. And we should overthrow it. Aristotle would be like, what are you talking about? You know, he would be Republican dad being like, that's the moral fabric, you know, of our society. We just build on it. So, yeah, the subjugation of irrational women and, and pre-rational or irrational children, I guess, depending on gender. No, 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 it's, it's, Aristotle says, you subjugate the Germans. Why? They don't take slaves, so they don't put the rational over the irrational, so Germanic people like me, Vikings, etc., you know, Nordic folks, eh, you gotta slave them because they don't slave, so they're irrational, you know, people, because they don't rational proportion the slaves beneath the rational people. They don't subjugate women, they don't subjugate slaves, they don't subjugate children. That's too anarchist, that's not rational Republican dad. So, in Plato's Republic, oddly enough, um, which is a different sort of Republicanism, uh, plenty, that it's, you have Thrasymachus basically saying very much a similar thing, um, and that, yeah, it's uh, different people, different things, and then you obey, you know, so, so essentially, Justice, uh, Socrates says that justice, which is more of an all ambiguous kind of good, includes self-control, is virtuous for all people. So here he is not saying don't subjugate women and slaves, which is what one should say regardless of your political views, because what, no matter whether you want to be conservative or progressive in society today... Socrates is probably not most so progressive as much as he is, but happiness sort of or goody goodness happiness is the same regardless of your position. Here I love I like Taoism uh, a lot. I've have a bunch of talks about Taoism. Taoists say wonderful things about women and slaves, and that doesn't necessarily mean one has to say they are actually saying, and we're having the movement next week. Now, you know, that's, and in fact, many of them probably would just figure these are the ways of things and just go along, you know, with whatever, whether or not you are like, you know, or like this or that. So in with all of this, you definitely have, well, men are men, and then everybody else listens to the man in the family, which is very China, is very Taoism also. Um, and then, but there's still, there can be disagreement. So it's different for some people just that, or is it for all people can Major world religions, especially the point should be made, suggested that virtue is true for all people. They kept all sorts of divisions in slavery, and that was a godsend popular, that was the popularity contest. People got into systems that were more appealing to slaves and women because you're a whole society plenty. That's something to remember. It's not just the powerful who get into systems, it's everybody. So if your system appeals to a lot of women and slaves saying a whole lot of things, that's great. You know, I mean, it's good enough for government work, you know, and everybody else working. 
you know, plenty. Um, so I do caution everybody. Egyptians have praised, you know, all sorts of good virtues as an em as empire and said, and those enemies subjugate their women and children and treat them poorly. Be careful how much you think the enemy mistreats their lowest of people. That's a good life lesson, actually, for a lot of this stuff. If you're hearing your enemy mistreats the lowly people and the sensitive people, that's kicking somebody's funny bone propagandistically, whether or not we're us or you or I or we have our politics. Be careful about believing the enemy harms the weakest of people, even if you can cherry pick the best examples. This also here, I'm going off on a tangent. This here is a good point, though, is because it is remarkably similar to politics still today. You can ask yourself, does this change or does it not? Well, in fact, we have the same angles on it. But of course, progressiveness would think, and my own politics, would be a bit more framing this in terms of current events and say, the recent uh, voting for all men who don't own property and then also for women is like, that's very recent in anybody's uh, history. So remember that, keep that in mind as we think over ancient thinkers believing in freedom and justice and things. And then also, of course, being of the form of their times. And it is very similar today so we can relate to them and also have problems with people still today. All of them, you know, especially those we do like. So Mino, those are the people you hang out with. Mino, who has brought many slaves with him to Athens. So Socrates is in a situation where he's saying, oh, it's the same for everybody. And he happens to be hanging out in a place with a rich guy who is surrounded by slaves. So he is walking into a conversation and he's sitting down and he's saying, by the way, I don't think what you just said, slave mastery guy, like heck, Socrates himself may have had a slave or two, was not the poorest of guys but was not the wealthiest of guys either, it seems, but was not broke. So he walks into a guy who happens to be surrounded by, and it would not be slaves of just one ethnicity. There would definitely be lighter skinned Thracian, uh, blue eyed, bl uh, blonde and or red haired slaves, etc., cetera, and, and others. We're sitting there fanning them with palm leaves, you know, as a somewhat olive skinned complexioned uh, Mediterranean dude. And he's sitting there and he's saying, you know, whether he had African, European and both slaves, is that Socrates, which is a good thing to, you know, remind us European and, and white folk, is that Socrates is sitting there being like, no, no, it's the same for everybody, whether or not you're a master or slave. And he's talking to a guy getting fanned by at least three people, probably, you know, of various hues. And it's like, no, he's telling him that it doesn't matter if you think they're white or black barbarians compared to your Mediterranean middle, uh, middle, <laughs> middle upper class self. Nah, nah, nah. You know, he's slaved and Bluetooth several devices together, I suppose. Is that, yeah, no, um, children and slaves have the same sort of virtue, which implies here that they have the same sort of intelligence, all mashed together emotion, intelligence, all of that rationality. As the mind, they all have the same somewhat mind and good, which is going to be telling a master he's no more better than all the slaves he's clearly subjugating all around him in practice as they fan him and prepare his grape skinnings, you know. He only eats the grape skins, the weirdo. So, yeah, the uh, feeding someone grape skins is an expression no one has ever used, nor should. Uh, it's, yeah, it's bitter, uh, yes. Uh, it's, uh, and so we shall no, use no art. So while Socrates, in his early dialogue of Plato here, does not say what virtue is, which again, he is leaving it nice and open, and he says, I'm a stingray that stings myself. He says that it must be one and not many. We have here an example of what is can be called and has been by other folks, especially who study Neoplatonism, which is Pla Socrates to Plato to other folks after Plato. Not really Aristotle. He's not really the Platonist Neoplatonist. He is plenty of the Platonist, but not called as such. He is an Aristotle and Aristotelian. At least one of them identically with himself is that you have here Plato is definitely saying something through Socrates where oneness, not manyness, is the problem of the one and the many. Again, to reiterate, often go into is my hand one or many things. Well, it's many things, but manyness is sort of not oneness, but oneness is sort of not manyness. So everything you look at is kind of manyness and oneness. There's many ways of attacking this, but there's ways our minds duck rabbit work as one many, where of course it's going to be many and one things. Wittgenstein, a thinker I love, says we don't call for the broom and the broom hand. Handle. We call for the broom. So effectively, you're calling for every atom in the broom and the broom handle. But in another way, it's different to say, I'm calling for every atom in the broom right now. Uh, there's a guy, Paul Ziff, writes about language. He says, if your hand's stuck to the wall, you could say, I'm trying to free my hand. But you wouldn't say, I'm trying to liberate my hand, unless you're making a joke, because your hand is not attached to any political processes. Neither is politics right now. Hey, but, you know, it's a living.
That is the truck, one of the trucks that serves the construction workers across the street that make my life interesting with all of these videos. So yes, the uh, it's been coming for years. Uh, so yeah, the you have here uh, life, oneness, manyness, the sounds outside. You have an example of oneness and manyness here where suggesting oneness over manyness is something where I do remind people is polytheistic societies admiring somewhat monotheism that is somewhat taken in, in Egypt and Persia, Zoroastrianism, etc., which is very Abrahamic, proto-Abrahamic with winged angels, etc. And these are a lot of people doing science with religion and all of this, and they are increasingly saying there's a oneness to all that's a whole plan and a thing, and then there's many angels or many spirits or jinn working for it. So there is a one over manyness, which even I, I do advise people to think, if we talk about objectivity versus scientific bias, we are talking about a sort of psychic oneness versus manyness, and I don't mean that it's psychic. I mean that it is simply the way we experience psychological reality as a soccer team or a team of scientists or a religious sect or as a troop of Jehovah's Witnesses making sure they knocked on every door is that you would experience things as a oneness and a manyness and there's a manyness to subjectivity and a oneness to objectivity and Socrates is saying not necessarily he is saying there is a oneness to love very uh, Empedoclean there's a oneness to love and objectivity, which is very much the care and the oneness at the center, which does seem proto-monotheistic, if not monotheistic, um, which is why you have Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle, and others, Stoics and others, um, being then incorporated into Abrahamic cultures and other things, or they could be, and then there's problems or not, is that there is a, even though Plato and Aristotle are very card-carrying polytheists, they are talking about onenesses versus manyness and all one mindness, very Anaxagoras. There is a one mind that shakes all things. And then when we say there's a one mindness behind things, that is oddly enough, when we say there's scientific objectivity or there's a subjective, uh, there's a scientific truth out there we will find. Are there facts on the other side of Alpha Centauri? Facts are kind of human agreements. So there's agreements on the other side of Alpha Centauri. We kind of project this view as if there's an all view that we can all hold in common. And that's not a bad or a good thing. It's what it is. In fact, polytheists all talk like we are doing X and they did X all, all kinds of ways. But there is, among civilized philosophical text-circling folks, increasingly uh, monotheism out of polytheism, and that is the religious context of a bunch of Greek polytheists doing philosophy and then religion, and the Abrahamic religions being a lot of a vehicle of this kind of Plato to us today. So, he, Socrates basically, and we're going to glide over a bit of his thinking, uh, he basically says here, that, well, I don't find you convincing, and it's basically oneness, but I don't know what that is. Which, of course, it's sort of not putting divisions in the mystical, kind of somewhat vague oneness, but here it doesn't have to be mystical versus scientific if we're thinking the one reality versus the many perspectives of it, which are subjective versus the objectivity, unifying, as it were. So Mino, befuddled here, compares Socrates to a stingray, a fish that stuns its victims. And Socrates says, unlike a stingray, he is stunned himself. <laughs> With his own sting. Again, uh, stingray, sting thyself. Yes? Is somebody, is there a doctor in the house? In the Republic, a later dialogue in which Plato begins putting forward his own ideas, Socrates proceeds to construct the form of the good with the help of others. In the Mino, Socrates suggests that while the definition of good may be beyond us, we can be led to do good if we seek it out. Mino argues it is impossible to search for something if we do not know what we are searching for. This is actually, uh, there is something worth pausing on here. There are many ancient logic sort of puzzle riddles that, that circle the world over. For instance, I remember there's sort of a Turkish kind of Siberian tale of a shaman girl who is in some kind of uh, fight with an ogre, actually, for some reason. Uh, and she is, she says, I put on a net and I'm chewing bark and I'm leaning over a doorway. So I'm clothed and not clothed, wearing fishnets as being clothed and not clothed, I suppose for young ladies, is halfway out the door. So I'm in and out. And I'm also chewing bark, which means I'm neither fasting nor eating. And the ogre's like, curse it, and disappears in like a puff of smoke because she outsmarted the ogre wisely as a girl who's also a shaman. So 
in those sorts of logic puzzles, which you find the smarter, wiser shaman or priest or figure or philosopher or people doing, you find humanity conveying a lot of wisdom and smarts and wisdom tales. There is a very famous one which does appear in ancient Greece and also other cultures. Across cultures, it appears in Greek and Islamic and then Christian sources. I know of that. In which, if you seek for something that you do not know what you are searching for, I believe this actually is, and I think somebody with... <laughs> Would remind me, I think this actually even comes across in the Greek epics, and I'm forgetting. Uh, well, that's appropriate with the Mino, actually forgetting, as we'll get to, and then hopefully forget about. Again, is that it is Im if it's impossible to search for something, if you seek what you cannot find, uh, there's a very famous riddle, if you seek what you find, yet you carry it with you, which would be somebody having fleas or another thing on their person that they're looking for and they can't find. And there's very famous tales of bringing a, a, like a bum with fleas on them and saying, aha, see, they seek for what they cannot find and bringing them to the party. There's various versions of that. I'm not sure what the first is. I don't know if it's, uh, although I know it's in Greek, ancient culture, and then it is something you find in Islamic culture. I believe it's in the Arab, uh, Arabian Nights, which in which you find a lot of trickster plot twists, dreams within dreams, devices before Shakespeare, etc. That you have a lot of these smarts, these plays of opposites, these twists of reason and logic, which I like Wittgensteinian thought experiments and duck rabbits. I think that's the latest sort of iterations. I like Poe, Carroll, Wittgenstein. You have here seeking for something you do not know what you are seeking for. Socrates tells Mino that according to some priests and poets, which again sounds like this sort of legendary stuff, human souls, uh, well, he's, he segs from that in the riddles, that he then sort of goes into another thing of reincarnation here and a deeper riddle of human souls and individuality in the communal. And he says human souls are immortal is his answer here, and have been reincarnated again and again over the ages, while the souls forget what they know each time they are reborn. In fact, they are merely ignorant of what they know already, concealing it from themselves, and so what humans call learning is in fact recollection, almost remembering. Think about like if you were dismembered and your arms and legs are lying about, and then if you are remembered... You are bringing together a body and a mind and, and arms and legs, and you're bringing together, oh, wait, what was that thing with the other thing? Oh, yeah, no, yeah, and you bring it together in your imagination from pieces. Recollection is collecting what has been collected and then scattered. So you have something like we all have the oneness, and we know all the Pythagoreanism, I suppose, even here in early Socrates, but we've forgotten all the divine math. We've forgotten all the things, because now Socrates is going to walk the slave boy through math, and he's going to show that we can intuit out math, and we can make the moves through math, any of us, even the lowly, uneducated slave boy, because we all have the pieces of the puzzle already. We have just forgotten that we have the pieces of the puzzle. This is where uh, Socrates, as Plato here... Uh, his character, his mouthpiece, and his dialogue is presenting us with the famous Platonic uh, idea of recollection and uh, that all is simply, uh, we are reincarnated, we've drank from the river Styx, although that's Roman or the band, and that yes, they basically, we uh, effectively are never actually learning anything, we're only remembering. Now, I of course don't support necessarily that theory. Um, many would not that actually, you know, necessarily anything about say, say supposedly reincarnation or even that recollection. Although early people around the world often believed in some strange form of reincarnation, a lot of the time um, that souls kind of go back up or down and then come back. And that's kind of, you know, stuff is stuff and recycle the stuff, which is process of nature. And analogously, we see all the time all around us. Again, Pythagoras may have thought beans were little hibernating souls aging in, I guess, uh, perhaps, which is why he would not eat them in a burrito, is that you have here that we are anamnesis in the Greek is how we can seek the good and we do not know it, that we can just feel it out because we've seen it before. It is interesting that if you don't believe this, why is it, and there's great Wittgensteinian wonderful problems, why is it that we feel so much out that we haven't yet thought and then we have to think once we've felt it out? Well, I believe in that a lot a la Wittgenstein, but here Socrates doesn't just say we feel it out for the first time and then our thinking uh, follows very much and is in, uh, woven into our emotions, uh, which is what Wittgenstein and I think Hume would very much say that is, reason is the slave of the, and servant of the passions and ought to be, oddly, uh, with the Mino here. But that actually the reason we're able to feel out what's rational is because we've seen the rational before. Not because we actually feel out first and then reason also, but and verbalize also, and mathematic also. 
statistics also, but that we first and foremost feel it out because we've seen it before, and so we feel for what we have seen and we already truly know. This is Socrates actually in many ways in early Plato making room for what later is going to come in as a whole lot of Timaeus the Pythagoreanism, explaining to us how actually the universe, just like uh, Plato's Republic, is a rational trinity of trinities of trinities, and that's a bunch of rational ratioed threes and threes and threes, so we live in a rational cosmos full of trinities, which shows us that it is a rational design and planned, which is how we know mathematics is rational, because it was a plan and the whole thing works, which many people would not say today while also saying mathematics and the world is rational. I always find that interesting. As a secular, decent enough person myself, as a non-practicing, non-religious person, it is interesting people say the world is rational, and of course one could ask how, and here is a very interesting theory as to how, even though this is on its way to monotheism, a la Anaxagoras, but not fully yet. You know, this is still polytheism, but there definitely is room for monotheism here. As there is, one could oddly say in... I would say even in sort of saying the world is rational according to scientific materialist determinism, who's rational how? You know, where the uh, there are platonic... It's a good point to say. I was about um, I'm re-remembering it. I remembered it moments ago as talking. Now I'm re-remembering it again. There are many platonic mathematicians still who believe that uh, for some reason, it's not the brain. Math is ideal. It is of its shape. And Plato was kind of right. And Pythagoras thus was kind of right. But why, and there's sort of no answer why, almost like the world's a hologram designed by no one that happens to have a laser math structure. It's like, well, okay, you know, if it's not the brain that structures math, if it's just math purely itself and is the soul of the... Co where does that come from? You know, all sorts of questions Plato doesn't answer. I'm not sure of each and every mathematician who's platonic. But of course, there's others who are of other camps. And I have to say, it's sort of a chicken and an egg kind of pulled out of the hat here. Um, but yeah, Plato somewhat similarly, which would make it rather platonic himself, yes, is saying that there's just some sort of form of the good and we know it and then we can just feel it out because it's already out there and we've seen it already. Here I will say there's many platonic mathematicians, but I don't know how many of them, I don't think many, subscribe to the idea of recollection. That actually it's because all of us in a previous existence or in the primary one somehow, beyond perhaps uh, beyond time, uh, have seen math before in its full form, and that's why we're recognizing it. They certainly wouldn't say with Brouwer and intuitionists we feel it out for the first time. In fact, that's exactly what they're specifically rejecting as platonic mathematicians. They don't think we've, I think, along with Brouwer and Wittgenstein, we feel math out each time we use it. I don't think they do. And in fact, you can, you know, correct me if I'm wrong, not just about math, but Wittgenstein. Um, but I would say we more with Wittgenstein feel out forms of life, a la Socrates early, whether or not there are the forms of math there before we're feeling them out and constructing them is a wonderful chicken and egg problem that these guys are dealing with. We still do, I will tell you. I'll get to tell you next semester more with modern philosophy, Feyerabend, and others, but definitely that's worth pausing on because it's quite fascinating. So, there's a story also worth mentioning here. The Buddhists mention a story, if you, uh, if you like this idea of recollecting, there's a way that this is wonderfully intuitive also, that we already have kind of the goodness was inside you all along. That we actually, and it's very Zen and Buddhist also, because the Zens are, Zen folks are Buddhist, you already have the gold and the wonder and the happiness all along. You just kind of cover it up and screw it up, so you're never going to kind of get happier than you already could be always. You just kind of muck it up with different stuff. So there's really nothing to gain or lose. And the Buddhists say that it's like a king who sews gold into his coat, oddly not into his chest, but in his coat, which is a weird place to place the inner gold. But he puts it in the lining of the coat, which is the inner, and then he gets so drunk that he blasts his memory, his long-term memory off, somehow a la Oliver Sacks, and now is living as a bum with tons of billions of dollars of bullion in his coat. You know, you can't steal a briefcase full of salmon, tell the economics, you know, kind of stuff. It's like, but you can millions of dollars, so he has millions of dollars of gold in his coat, and he doesn't need to barter. He's got currency forms, and somehow the state still stands in the gold such that he can have inner gold Old and he's wealthy as heck, he just doesn't know it. That is similar, actually. We actually already have, for Plato, though, it's not just we have the inner gold of the attitude of, that's enlightened uh, for the Buddha, which is truth is more of an attitude, not the form. Socrates almost suggests here, no, we already know the form of math, we've just forgotten it, which is why we find the form pleasing, not just we're feeling out the tuning fork, we may be or not. It's again, it's very odd, but it's uh, interesting over crossings, and it has to do with fundamental issues of object, objective truth Socrates here is still quite skeptical a la Buddha and Heraclitus. Plato will turn it otherwise right around book two of the Republic. 
Mino asked for a demonstration very famously, and Socrates asked him to pick out one of his slaves. Me he, go for it. Pick a card, any card. One of yours. Mino picks a Greek slave boy and calls him forward. Socrates, in the most famous part of the dialogue, leads the boy through a proof of geometry in spite of the boy is a slave, possibly illiterate. In fact, most people would be at this time, not only slaves. Um, and he leads the... I am. I often try... try I often want to point out to people, logic may be something pre-literate and pre-mathematical, along with the human brain and emotions, which we feel things out. Uh, that's good. I like feeling things out in Wittgenstein and all of that and duck rabbits we feel and see. So in a certain sense, there's good. How do we learn to feel to see a duck rabbit is an interesting interrelated, but we won't go all Wittgenstein right here. The slave boy, though, can look at the duck rabbit, which is the the geometry math problem, remember much math would not be at all algebraic, it would be as squares right in front of you. And I have interesting illustrations on my website, one of them uh, animated, someone constructed, I'm not sure to whom to credit or not. But yeah, you've got forms of that so the slave boy can walk through the math because he could feel out the math as Socrates very leadingly leads him through the math. You can definitely accuse Socrates of asking the boy leading questions like some kind of improper lawyer, you know, who should be cut off by the judge or the other lawyer if he's getting paid enough. But effectively, the boy is able to, with leading questions, find his way through basic geometry, which shows that we are all alike in understanding math and goodness. Now, this is actually kind of progressive education John Dewey insofar as it shows we can teach slaves geometry because they have full human minds. And that's awesome in what year is this. But at the same time, whether or not you can, uh, you can for Greek uh, Mediterranean people, convince white and black, as we would call them today, slaves, you know, that, who are uneducated and illiterate, the Irish, you know, if you can get them to walk their way through math, through feeling it out, then it's not that he is abolishing slavery, though. Um, he is, you know, you can then further speculate what he's saying about this and he says stuff, but that he is at least showing that the common person has a mind that can feel out geometry. So they have reason. So they have love, which for Socrates is very much kind of wisdom, love, the same thing. Love of wisdom, philosophy, wisdom, love, etc. Something like that, which is possibly Pythagoras's phrase. Socrates draws a square on the floor in the sand, the way geometry was done in ancient Greece. Remember, Pythagoreanism, the square was never seen as a little two beside an, uh, uh, and it was not A, B, and C written as that. It would be squares and little squares in the squares, and you count them. You don't just uh, know, memorize shortcuts, which is what algebra actually is. In when we use it geometrically, we're just skipping over the geometry and taking mental shortcuts, which these guys would walk out as one walks out a word problem. Remember, uh, like this, actually, this right here, math was done as word problems. This is a word problem, math problem right here presented for people very famously. It would not be algebraic language. That's shorthand, which Muslims came up with much, much later. And that all looks much more mechanical and, and impresses people with how quick and easy it all is, such that we can carve ourselves easier apart from the barbarians, of course. Walls, gears, math, abstractions. Brouwer and the intuitionists, along, uh, who is similar to Wittgenstein in his later work, basically says math has been felt out to subjugate slaves. He talks very much like a Marxist. Why have we felt out math in the ways and used it the ways we have? Pretty much to subjugate slaves in the lower class. And you're like, whoa, dude. <laughs> and he's, uh, yeah, he comes off kind of as a Marxist like heck. Um, because, and it, oddly enough, it's a juncture between, you don't have to be a Marxist as an intuitionist. Brouwer definitely takes it there. Um, which oddly is almost like he's doing Plato's Republic. And then again, like the feminist Aristotle decides to slam it. You know, we've been feeling out the subjugation with the maths the whole time dangs it. And of course he's like, well, yeah, that's history, you know? And so, yes, we've been using math to subjugate the slaves. So oddly enough for Brower here, yeah, Socrates is going to show us even the slaves can do math, keep firing a-holes, you know what I mean? A la Mel Brooks. So I knew it. I'm surrounded, you know? Uh, you hopefully get the quote, kids. So the boy actually guesses incorrectly um, at first. Socrates draws the square. He asks the boy how long a line would have to be to, to be the side of the square twice as large as the square on the floor. The boy guesses incorrectly, guessing that a line twice as long would be, uh, but it's far too much. 
it's actually, again, for us, we would probably do algebra and calculate it. But these guys would actually look at the triangles and the squares and show that the triangles and the squares overlap, where we would do algebra and actually see it as far less of a spatial but more of an arithmetic problem, oddly enough. Which is really interesting to physically think out. Again, Wittgenstein says if math was done on plexiglass cubes the whole time, it would look entirely different. Like, we'd be lining, you know what I mean? It'd be like some sort of strange puzzle game. And that, again, is not how... Uh, that's not how math is done. Um, so we do it physically the ways we do it, oddly to say. And we have to do it physically on paper somehow to do it the ways we do it. So here again, you have a whole lot of mental-physical interrelation that we are still having wonderful problems with. And I like Wittgenstein. The boy is... Led through the proof, though, he screws up, but then Socrates walks him carefully through this step and that step, and he gets the boy to actually see, ah, but then this, ah, but then that. So the boy hastily makes the wrong judgment, but he does like we all would, and then Socrates says, but remember, but see this, but see that, which for Socrates is showing the boy what he already knows, but I guess leaped over and is still forgetting. And this then shows the boy uh, how to work his way through the problem. Socrates constructs a square of four sides, each side of the original square, and leads the boy by questions, questions to see that if the four squares are bisected with diagonal lines, you can construct a square in the center, and this is by him then counting out, again, the, the triangles, as you can see in the image on the website, but you can do for yourself if you walk through the dialogue. If you count out that it's four versus eight triangles, not calculate it with algebra and, more, and sort of arithmetics, he basically, using that spatial form, shows the boy that you can have four versus eight, that's half, right? And the boy at least knows four is half of eight. Um, perhaps, and again, Siberian peasants likely would know the same, although they have trouble with 16 or so. Because why have 16 anything if you're in Siberia? Seriously, you don't have to. Socrates believes that the ability of the slave boy to make each judgment correctly on his own is evidence that we do not know all things and comes to and that we do <laughs> misspoke. We do know all things. I'm following the form I've seen before but have forgotten. And come to recognize that we have concealed from ourselves when we see it again, and wrote it originally in my case. In the Apology, Socrates argues that we think we know, but don't know that we don't know. He says this to the assembly, ticks them all off, they kill him for it. Now in the Mino, Socrates is oddly arguing that we do know, but we don't know that we know. So which is it? It seems like he's completely reversed his, his position a la the duck rabbit. He's probably being ironic, a Kierkegaard would say so. And why does the, how does this duck rabbit work? What's going on, as the Exploratorium says? So how are these two to be reconciled? Socrates is drawing a contrast between false human reasoning. He's being very Heraclitean here. We talk, but we don't really talk like the gods talk. So it's relative, but it is real, sort of. He's saying we have false lower human knowledge, and the true knowledge of the cosmos can lead us through intuition to the good, just as Socrates, he leads the slave boy through the geometric proofs. Like Anaxagoras says, mind leads us as a dumb beast, as a human person leads a beast. As our better, ranking so, beyond, as a rank, thus somewhat separate, although parallel. Our mortality, our limitations as human beings, conceals from us what we truly are, which we recognize even as it is, seems continuously, almost categorically, beyond us, though not explicitly, will be decently later, categorically for Plato, forms of the worlds beyond. Aristotle and Plato definitely seem to talk as if, for the Aristotle, above the lunar sphere, things are quite ideal. Which means actually the solar motions, it's like the solar system is actually ideal and then our lives are messed up down here because we're not as ideal as, our, as the upper motions of things. Which of course nowadays the planets are just large, they're not ideal, kind of like Cthulhu. You know, well he's far from ideal, you know, and so are each of we. So, you know, again, well it's too late for Cthulhu 2020 again, so but yes, all of that. So, yeah, cynicism all aside, we haven't gotten to the cynics even yet. So, Mino is convinced by Socrates' demonstration that he is right, to which Socrates characteristically re replies that he does not know whether he is wholly right about the matter or not. He still takes that sort of trickster attitude throughout Plato, but he starts to be like, but this really seems it, don't it? After they're done lecturing at length without dialogue, as I do to you, there's no back and forth here, um, is that, yeah, he goes on and on and on later, but here he says, well, I don't know, maybe a little, you know, uh, it's sort of the truth that kind of, I guess we kind of got, which is the only answer he can say, because if he says we knocked it out of the park fully, that's going to not work with the vague good we're kind of ever striving towards as the mortal humans, would it? 
it's similar again to Anaxagoras. We are human minds. Uh, we are led by a human overall uber one mind. Here's the one mind which does resemble Abrahamic religion, Christianity, and Islam, such that Christians and Muslims pass these Greek texts and knowledge of them down to others and use them for logic, philosophy, cosmology a lot. People forget about that. We'll get to that with the Timaeus. A lot of their science is vegetation is the hair of the world because Plato said so. And yeah, um, there's a lot of that in medieval history. And that's early science, you know, as far as the medieval people use ciencia in the Latin, you know, as a word. So we have here, um, again, leeches does something, just doesn't do much, apparently. Mino is convinced by Socrates' demonstration, again, that he is right. And Socrates says, well, I don't know. And Anaxagoras, again, says, well, we're sort of, and this is Heraclitus and Anaxagoras. We are children to the gods. They do not sort of impiously suggest we can rank up and become gods ourselves. And Pedicles says so, throws himself into a volcano. I don't recommend that as your attorney. Again, I'd get a car with no top, and I would throw yourself into the volcano. Uh, again, if you have to do any more of this. So I will thus, uh, yeah, wrap it up here. Anyway. Hope uh, you guys enjoyed the talk. Hope you enjoy my other talks. I have worked out some, a series on Taoism. I'm going to get into some Zen for the Buddhist philosophy class, but we will follow, and thank you for your patience, to the Greek philosophy class currently watching this or watching this whole, whole mere minutes after I post it, of course. I will be working through the Plato, the Aristotle, the Stoicism, and the Epicureanism in the next week and or two, and I've gotten my process down here. So we will be having a lot more Greek philosophy videos and more uh, as well as, if you would like, Chinese and Zen philosophy and Japanese philosophy videos to follow soon. So much happiness, and I'll see you if I see you.